I woke up one morning and I had this feeling that today was the day. And it's the same feeling soldiers get before battle or a mother gets about a child or something. There's a, a quality of knowing. I went back to sleep and the next thing I know, I was standing outside my body and there was darkness around me. I was trying to get back to my body, but I couldn't. So I'm, I'm, I see my body and I see these waves of light coming off of, which now I know is biophotons. <laughs> they, they leave your body when you die. I was trying to get back to it and couldn't. And it was a, it was a very, very weird feeling. And then darkness closed in on me and I felt like I fell into a black hole. It was all darkness. I was totally alone. I really thought, is this how it ends? You fall in some dark hole and this, this is how it ends. That was pretty scary. After falling into what felt like a black hole, the second stage of Mellon's experience commenced, his life review. This is a common trait in many near-death experiences. Here Mellon takes it into the context and meaning of a life review. Then what people now call a life review began for me. The life review began for me, and it's a little different for each person because we are unique individuals and unique set of frequencies, but for me it kind of began with the moment of my death and ticked all the way backwards all the way back into the womb. I was seeing images of my life, and I was seeing things, you, you, a lot of things you've forgotten that you'll remember, as you see your whole life. And even uh, memories in childhood that later, talking to my mother, she said, you couldn't remember that, you were too young. Or you weren't even born. So for me, it ticked all the way back. It was a, it was a sad life review. And the biggest, saddest thing of all is, I was born into a family that nobody had any love skills. Uh, we didn't know how to show love to each other. And so I never developed the love receptors. So I went through my life thinking that love was a mental illness. And that's how I looked at it. The sad thing in my life review was I got to see how many people had tried to love me. And I never got it. I didn't have the receptors. And that really made me sad because I thought there was no love. And there was always love. As, as it went back, it got sadder because my parents were pretty dysfunctional. They fought all the time my mother was pregnant with me. And as a fetus, you're full, I know, I can tell you're fully conscious. And the fights and the hitting and the beating and all that was, I was in the middle of it all. And, I, and a fetus is connected to the mother's hormones, nervous system and everything. So I was feeling everything deeply. So by the time I was born, I, I, I'd already had my worldview set. My worldview was set. And that worldview was, this is not a fun place. It's a dangerous place. And because my dad was beating my mother all the time, I had this attitude that males are dangerous things. So I never bonded with males. I always had female friends. The life review is not to make you make you feel guilt or anything because there's no judgment, but there is the hardest judgment. That is self-judgment. And that's the hardest judgment you'll ever face. So every word you ever say about anybody sticks to them. The Kunas call it Akka threads, the Silver threads, it's all kinds of words for it in all cultures. And people will remember these things because you've, you've connected to them. You may not have been in the room with them when you're talking about it. And they'll have a life review and they may see, they may hear this or see it. And they'll know exactly who it came from. <laughs> the good news is if you, if you have not been able to get to somebody and, and get into forgiveness with them, do it anyway out loud in privacy because it will be part of their life review. It doesn't go away. It sticks. So you, you judge yourself on things that nobody else would judge you about. And also you, you, you never give yourself credit for heroic things you may have done. Um, being raised in North Carolina, a lot of snakes and turtles on the roads. If I saw a snake or a turtle in the road, I had to stop and save them. And I was shown one incident of that. It was heavy traffic, people getting off work, I guess. And I saw this turtle stuck on the white line. And I didn't even think. I pulled over and I got myself into the center lane, you know, cars whizzing by to pick up the turtle. And now I realized I'm just like the turtle. Whizzing by right and left, people not even caring. And I made my way back to the side of the road, risking my life for a turtle and put it into the woods. And I got to see, wow, that was, uh, I didn't even think that was heroic, I just did it. So think about all those things you do for your children and others and animals and these little things that are really things you should pat yourself on the back for. You know, we do a lot of good things we may not give ourselves credit for. The second fold purpose of the life review is that you are heading towards the light at some point, whether you see it or not. When you're having your life review and you're remembering all this, it benefits the entire planet because it's all going into the super mainframe. The soul collects everything, every experience ever happened. So imagine that your life review benefits everybody on planet Earth all through history. Imagine that. 
It's important stuff. It's universal importance. And so this, I, I call it the big super mainframe, but it's all being stored there. Call it the Kazakh records. It's, it's really the soul of us all. And it benefits all of us. And, and then when you do go through the light, you benefit from that in many ways. And of course, the more conscious you become, the more you benefit from it. Once Mellon's life review ended, his belief system was shaken up by the appearance of an angel. Although it wasn't just any angel, it was Mellon's very own guardian angel. When, when my life review ended, uh, I found myself in this darkness again. But, oddly enough, an angel appeared to me. And it was a golden angel. And I didn't believe in angels. You know? And I, 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 I now can tell you, because I've had uh, 33 years of going to the light every day, that what will immediately play, the first thing it's going to play, is whatever you learn before you're six or seven. And one of the things was, I had always thought of angels as figurines, you know, with a candle in the head, you know, that kind of. And this appeared as as a golden figurine type angel, but it was alive. The first thing I said was, "Are you the angel of death?" The angel said something very surprising. They just said, "No, I'm Melon, and I'm your guardian angel." And now I know your higher self aspect. That little there was always this little light somewhere. I could see, I could see like, I'd get glimpses of a little speck of light. But the angel told me that light starts in your heart. That's where it starts. It doesn't start at this end. It starts at this end for you. And to focus on that, you've got to love your life. And I thought, are you crazy? <laughs> love my life? And I struggled with that, but I still got help. And it still took years later <laughs> even to get the whole thing. But I did focus on this light and the connection was made. And uh, we're all connected to this light endlessly, and it can never be cut off, and it can never be perverted or polluted. It's uh, no matter what you think you've done, no matter who, what shaman has told you this, or voodoo guy, you know, you can never be cut off from it, even if you think you are. With his newfound knowledge of the light, he began trying to reach it. Grasping with all his might, he finally popped out in front of the indescribable entity. So I started connecting this this trail, and for me, it was not really a tunnel like everybody talks about. You know, not all near death. There's only only a few percentage of people see tunnels. For me, it looked like I was at the bottom of the ocean, and there was water with a light, and I was trying to get to the top of that, and it felt impossible. Like you're, you know, you don't have enough breath or energy. And I finally popped in front of this light that people talk about, and I was shocked, but I felt this presence that near deathers talk about. This is where Mellon's experience gets quite unique. Unlike others, Mellon had interactions and conversations with the light. He was given the privilege to ask any questions he desired, getting an answer directly from universal intelligence itself. And I blurted out, like I guess any good atheist would be, are, are, are you God? <laughs> and feeling like, uh-oh, what's next? Because well, what if all those nuns were right? And um, your soul knows you better than anybody call it the light, knows you better than anybody, and it will speak to you at whatever level you're at, whatever metaphor you're living in, whatever mythology you're living in, because we are mythical beings, and we live in our metaphors more than common sense, more than science. That's why we love poetry, and we love the movies. So it will speak to you like you've never, you'll feel like no one's ever known you before but this. So when I asked the question, are you God? The light said back to me, who and what is not God? And I got it. Well, that was just the first question, and the researchers say this is where my experience was unique, and that is that I got this feeling that I realized it was interactive, and they say this is the first time they've ever heard of that in all the research. And when I realized that, I said, uh, I have some questions, and we talk. And the light said, sure, what you got? And that began a very long conversation, which many people have read about, and I, although it all, the entire experience seemed like it took a second for me, it's taken 30 plus years to even tell half the story. My first question to the light was this. Why is humanity so dark and doomed? Why even bother with humanity? That's what killed me, is believing this. And then the light turned into a mandala. I went inside the light. I went into this mandala that I call the mandala of human souls. And it seemed like I could look into every human soul that had ever been, including my own. And to my amazement, I couldn't see any darkness at all, ever. There's no darkness in the human soul, no matter who you've been, no matter what you've done. And the light said to me, oh, beautiful human, 
And that changed my life. <laughs> that changed my life. Oh, beautiful human. That's how the soul looks at us. And that's what we are. We are the beautiful children of the universe. What some people don't like to hear is that with the light, the saint and the center stand alike. When you go through that light, it's a whole pro different process. But uh, this is the message I got, is that we are loved. Not only does we are loved in the soul, the soul is the universe. This is a whole total soul experience. I had a lot of questions for the light, but there came a point in my experience where I thought I was out of questions. I kind of ran out of questions. Then the light reminded me of something. The light said, but what was your first question? And you know, I knew what it meant because it was talking my language. There's a time when we're very young that we ask our first serious question about the universe. But because I had been in Catholic boarding school being told I'm going to hell forever, I started very young contemplating, why do we grow old and die? If there was a creator, why would you even bother doing that? I mean, what's the point? And this is what happened. Out of the light came two columns of light. And out of the right column, all I heard was dinja. And this little little guy with kind of an Indian voice stepped out and started educating me, started downloading me. Do you know who he was? He was the first one to really build scientific devices to heal people with light. So he was educating me on all the different wavelengths of light, and he, he made these uh, called uh, chromoscopes that were sold, and he was healing people right and left. He was, like, happy to download everything he could to me about light, 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 and, and what it was good for. And when he finished, uh, out of the left column, this guy stepped out. It was a short, portly guy with a funny hat and a mustache. And it turned out to be Walter Russell, which I didn't even know until I met uh, P. Mage Atwater. Turns out, he was a, a, one of America's great Renaissance men. His whole thing, he was so excited to tell me about electrons and photons. And starlight was the essence of, of life. And then he started drawing these things in, in the air. These, this is fractal geometry. I didn't even know that at the time. A fractal is a non-regular geometric shape containing detailed structure at arbitrarily small scales. It also has the same degree of non-regularity at every possible scale. They can be thought of as never-ending patterns. Walter Russell was far ahead of his time. Nikola Tesla admitted the power of his work and advised him to lock it up in a safe for a thousand years until mankind was ready for it. Combining art and science like no other, here he draws fractals and educates Mellon on the subject. Fractal geometry, it turns out, was developed in the 1800s, but it was so complicated that we really had to wait till we had supercomputers to really start using it. But Walter Russell was drawing and making paintings of fractal geometry by hand before computers. So he was gladly just drawing those in the air for me, and they were alive, they were spinning off. You know, in fractals. And he was trying to tell me that fractal geometry is God's geometry. And this is God's, this is God's, uh, God's mathematics. And he was trying to explain to me everything you could do with fractals. And if you understand how important fractal geometry has become in our life today, it's, an, it's infected everything from animation to quantum <coughs> physics. It's amazing how important that became once, once we could uh, use it, you know. And so he was explaining all this to me. And here's what he told me. The thing about fractal geometry that's fascinating is, and it's, it's just like the universe, uh, there's nothing new and nothing old. Things are always the same and always changing. And he was explaining to me that when you have a child, that is your biological fractal, and it's a part of reincarnation, because there's multiple layers of reincarnation that I learned a lot about when I asked that question. I, was, I learned that reincarnation is more real than even the spiritual people imagine, and it's a real science in the near future. And, but he was trying to explain to me how this related to even reincarnation. So this is a Mandelbalt set, and you'll notice as you look at it, it's always the same image, but it's going to freak you out how it changes. And he was explaining that if you understand this, you can track patterns of anything. You can track even past lives. You can track your, your patterns that will lead you into the future, because all karma is just cause and effect. It's a continuum. And if you watch this as, as we go, you, you think you come to the end of something, and then it begins again. It never ends. It's like when you die, you just open your eyes again. The new fractal begins. And it's always the same and always different. No matter which corridor, the soul enters, the soul comes out, lives enter, lives go out, universes come and go. 
at times it may look completely foreign to you, but again, it's still the same thing. It's the same soul image. How it started, we will never know. There'll never be an answer for that. You may think you're entering a new universe, even if you're a star traveler, and the minute you get there, a new one begins. After returning to his body in 1982, he made daily trips back to the light, always bringing back something tangible for humanity. He became the inventor of many light-based creations and was a leader in light therapy technology. Mellon also made multiple astronomical predictions that were proven accurate over the years. In 2017, he passed away, leaving behind his inventions and knowledge. Rest in peace, Mellon Thomas Benedict. A true renaissance man.